One yes, Steve is more or less the same as another. Yeah. Way, um, but I am delighted to be interviewing Stephen, who I've known for a very long time, since he was at school, I think. Um, but I won't let that get in the, way, in the way of my interview. For those of you who don't know, I mean, Stephen is a co-host of this event. He's also the MP for Aberavon. He's Labour's front bench spokesman on Asia and the Pacific. And he's had a varied career before politics, starting in the European Parliament, through the British Council, World Economic Forum, and a role in private business, too. Now, uh, you probably won't want me to open the conversation this way, but I have to acknowledge the fact that you are also the child of two very prominent politicians. Indeed. Your father was the leader of the Labour Party, and your mother was a well-known MEP. You're also married to the former Prime Minister of Denmark, yep. so you know a bit about politics, and also about winning and losing and power. Mm. So what is your answer to the question? What is Labour's levelling up? Well, uh, I have a personal view on that, which is based on three words, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, reminiscent of Tony Blair's famous education, education, education. I think that it should be about manufacturing, manufacturing, and manufacturing. I think that when you look at the fundamental uh, problems at the heart of the British economy, you can trace them all back to the collapse of our manufacturing sector. In the 1970s, manufacturing accounted for about 30% of our GDP. It's now at about 9%. That collapse has led to uh, the uh, exodus of uh, resources and talent and wealth from uh, the parts of the country that I think we're focusing on today to London and the southeast. It's led for a tilt from uh, export to import and from production to consumption. And those fundamental problems are what have created this force that's ripped through the communities that we've, we've seen in the South Wales valleys, uh, in uh, the north and the midlands of England. Uh, that has, has destroyed the social fabric in many ways, led to high streets uh, going down the tubes and led to that sense of a narrative of decline. So I think what we're here today is to talk about what are the priorities in terms of addressing those fundamental issues. And I think that whichever way you look at it, all roads lead back to the collapse of manufacturing as um, the cause of the problem. Uh, so then it's a question about how you rebuild that manufacturing sector. What does your industrial strategy look like? What are the policies that you need to put in place uh, to make it happen? And I'm sure we can get on to that. But I think in, in a nutshell, I think that uh, the Labour Party should be making a very bold um, promise, which would be that a Labour government would get uh, our share of manufacturing in terms of GDP from 9% to 15% within one parliamentary term. Do you think that's a very relatable idea? I mean, you know, do you see that as the kind of elevator pitch for Labour? I or think... Does it have to be more in terms of people's lives? You know, that's something that Boris Johnson obviously does quite well, is to tell a, a story to people. Yeah, I think... And, the, and I think some people feel at the moment Labour hasn't really got a story. I think the story is around jobs. So I think if you say to people, this is the way in which we're going to provide good jobs that you can raise a family on, and we talk, I think we need to talk with much more passion and conviction about the dignity of labor. It's not just about the paycheck at the end of the month. It's that sense of pride and self-esteem, uh, uh, being proud of being, putting food on the table for your family, about being part of something bigger. Um, Sorry, the I'm mic's not working. Piano, a mic is on. Oh. Oh. Can you hear me? We, we can't hear you, they can't hear you online. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Well, do you want to, can, somebody can someone to... help maybe with the mic and get it switched on? Um, carry on, Stephen, you carry on, because yeah. the mic's on. Uh, well, I, it was just about, I think that what really resonates with people is uh, good work and good jobs, mm -hmm. and the dignity and the sense of, that, of what it brings to your sense of identity, uh, and defining who you are, and, and actually, that you know, the clue is in the name for the Labour Party. We are the Labour Party. We are the party of work and good jobs. And I think there's a real dividing line between ourselves and the Conservatives, frankly, because I think that people do see the Conservatives as um, being part of this race to the bottom, and you know, the prevalence of zero hours contracts, and this huge shift we've seen in our economy away from manufacturing to financial services in London and the Southeast, and to more low-paid, low-value added services, such as Amazon warehouses in the rest of the country that's replaced our manufacturing sector. I think there's also something that we should be talking about in terms of a Britain that can stand more firmly on its own two feet. 
uh, actually what is that post-Brexit vision for the future of the country. Um, and that also has to be about reducing our reliance on supply chains, it, importing pretty much everything that we need from countries like China. Uh, I think there's a lot of people in the communities that we're talking about today that don't like that. They think that model doesn't work and it doesn't uh, add to your sense of pride in your place, in your community or in your country. So I think it's about dig the dignity of labor and the pride that we get from being able to produce ourselves create those good jobs and, by the way, drive us towards decarbonisation and net zero, which I think is a big opportunity as well for showing that many of these communities were the cradle of the first industrial revolution. Let's make them the cradle of a green industrial revolution. And when I say that to the steel workers in my constituency, they're absolutely on board with it. They want to be a part of the solution. They don't want to be seen as a problem. They know that the only future for us is a cleaner, greener manufacturing sector and with steel at its heart. Okay, one of the things that has me shouting at the TV and radio is when I hear the phrase high skills economy because it's so unrelated to the way our education system works, mm. which is totally really focused on the high value of academic education rather than skills education. And, you know, so we heard an earlier speaker talking about people leaving their communities to go away, and often that starts with going away to university. What would Labour do about this issue of actually skills and giving skills real value and making it you know, young people feel that a, a skilled pathway is just as valuable as getting, for example, a, a degree in classics or English from Oxford or Cambridge. I, c I completely agree with you, and I think it relates in a way to that first question, which is about the, the collapse of the manufacturing sector, has sent a message to our young people, which is there aren't really any great opportunities in the areas of develop, where you develop technical skills in order to have those job opportunities. So I'm going to go off to university and, and do media studies instead and, and hope to get a, a job in London and never come back, right? So that has to change. Uh, I think that there's a big piece of this which is around the lack of dialogue that takes place between local education institutions and uh, the local private sector. Uh, so one of the things that Labour is talking about and Kate Green is, is talking about is, is convening, using... Uh, local enterprise partnerships or perhaps even creating a network of regional uh, educational um, forums that bring together uh, uh, trade unions, businesses and education providers so that they're actually producing the kind of curricula that people need in order to connect the jobs and the opportunities. So I think that's a big part of it. I also think there's a case to be made for depoliticizing the curriculum. Uh, one of the things we've seen in the education sector for far too long is politicians meddling uh, in the system, changing things around all the time, creating more and more bureaucracy for teachers. Uh, and there's, I think there's a case for creating uh, an independent agency that can actually um, take decisions and, gui and provide guidance on the kind of curricula that we need at a national level. And that should also be regionalized, so that's filtering down through the system and connecting up to the private sector more effectively. So that's some ideas, and I, but I think you're absolutely right that until we have parity of, of esteem between academic education and, and technical education, we're going to be grappling this, with this problem for a long time. Some of these ideas that I'm hearing around me today, I mean, it seems to me the obvious way to make them happen is for a form of politics that is more balanced, more coalition-based, rather than divisive and you know, oppositional, which is what we've got at the moment. Do you think there is a role to play for the electoral system in executing a different type of politics and bringing people together to find solutions together rather than somebody comes up with a good idea and then the other person feels they have to oppose it simply because it was put forward by the wrong party? Well, I'm a very strong supporter of proportional representation. Uh, I think that our first-past-the-post system is completely unfit for purpose. I think it creates uh, this awful idea of safe seats which get left behind and ignored. You know, power and resources uh, uh, follow the votes when it comes to the way in which governments think. And um, I think it's been very bad for our economic model to have this winner-takes-all culture. And there's so many other reasons why First Past the Post uh, doesn't work. I actually think it's very bad for progressive politics because the progressive parties are divided. Uh, and that's the, for that reason, you know, um, if you aggregate all of the votes that Labour have re has received in, since the Second World War, 
It's 40% uh, of all of the public vote in all of the elections since 1945. The Conservatives have taken 41% of all of the votes since 1945. The Conservatives have been in government for 63% of the time. So I think that tells you all you need to know about this uh, completely dysfunctional uh, electoral system we have, both from a point of view of, of being democratic, but also from the point of view of the outcomes that it delivers uh, to our communities. And it has, I think, been a big part of the huge uh, divides in wealth and opportunity that we see in the country. The United Kingdom is the most divided country uh, in terms of between regions, the, the wealthiest region being London and the southeast, mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, the poorest regions. It's, it's got the biggest divide in the entire OECD. So um, that's for a whole range of reasons that we, we've talked about already in terms of manufacturing, in terms of skills and education. But a big part of it is also a, a, can be traced back to the, uh, our electoral system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You, 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 you. you raised Brexit, not me, so I'm going to come back to it. I mean, some of us are struggling to see anything good to have come out of Brexit yet. W what role does Brexit play in regeneration and in Labour's making Brexit work? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I mean, I, George and I bear the scars of uh, trying to get a deal through Parliament that we called Common Market 2.0, and it was about accepting the result of the referendum, but taking the United Kingdom out of the political project but leaving us very closely aligned with the, the single market. And I think that that would have been the right thing to do. And I, I think Labour's decision to back a second referendum was a huge mistake for uh, a whole range of reasons. But we are where we are now. And uh, I think what we, the first step for us as, as a Labour Party has to be to say, we, see, we take the trade and cooperation agreement with the EU as a floor, not a ceiling. Uh, and what we need to do is drill down into it, identify the biggest weaknesses in it and what really constitute the biggest threats and risks to our economy, where is the friction and the barriers, and uh, sit down sensibly with the European Union at, you know, on day one after winning a general election and go through that and look at practical and pragmatic ways to resolve it. Uh, the, you know, I, there's, there's so, there are so many uh, dysfunctionalities in the deal that need to be uh, dealt with. And of course, we've got the huge issue of uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I'm extremely concerned with the sabre rattling that we're seeing and the, p the possibility that Article 16 will be triggered. And I think that could lead to the European Union suspending the entire trade and cooperation agreement. So we're back into the territory then of a no deal Brexit, which I'm sure fills everybody in this room with a great sense of joy. So we've got to find a way of making it as easy as possible to, for us to trade. Um, and one of the, the problems, I think, as uh, John Mill said in the video, is you know we've got this issue of collapsing product productivity. We don't export enough. If we have a trade deal, our biggest export partner is still the European Union. If we're not uh, able to trade in a frictionless manner with them, it's going to have a knock-on impact in terms of exports and in terms of productivity. And you get, uh, once again, into that vicious circle of manufacturing declining rather than being boosted, which I think should be the number one political priority of, of the government. So we've got to find a way of taking that TCA, making it the floor, not the ceiling, having those negotiations with the European Union. And I hope... Uh, with, with better relations and better trust between the two partners, we can, we can get a more pragmatic and constructive mm. outcome. And do you think you can sell that confidently to the people that you, you know, you, you're part of Renaissance, Renaissance Labour, is it Renaissance Labour? Which made me laugh because when I was, Frank Dobson, who was a friend of ours, always used to get over the old versus new Labour thing by saying he was heritage Labour. And now you're, <laughs> yeah. now you're Renaissance. Vintage Labour. Vintage yeah. Labour, yeah. <laughs> now you're Renaissance Labour, but I mean, can you sell this thing, this sort of softer Brexit, to the people you need to win back? Well, I think a lot is going to depend on people's lived experience over the next uh, year or two. And um, if, if enough people in the country come to the conclusion that you've come to, Fiona, that the, you're not seeing uh, the benefits um, and that we need to find pragmatic solutions which just ensure that our economy isn't being hit for six by all of this, then I, I think people, we'd, we'd be going with the grain of the argument. Um, I do think that there's, I, I think that when I talk to my constituents, um, there is also a sense that we are living in a 
pretty turbulent world, and uh, there is an increasing worry about uh, isolation. And it just feels like a world that's not very good to be isolated in right now. And we saw over the summer with what happened with Afghanistan and the way in which the United States appears to be withdrawing. Um, and uh, we've obviously left the European Union. And I think there is a, I don't think it's, you know, people aren't sort of saying it top of their minds, but there's a, there's a gnawing issue at the back of people's minds, which is that we're starting to feel like and look like an increasingly isolated country. And this is not a world in which you want to be isolated, where we're seeing uh, more and more great power competition. We're seeing the collapse in many ways of the multilateral system. We're seeing uh, Putin backing Lukashenko to send migrants to the border of Poland and 100,000 Russian troops massing on the borders of Ukraine. We're seeing China expanding uh, its uh, worldview, uh, buzzing Taiwanese airspace over 300 times last year. So there's also something about, I think, needing an anchor in the world. And um, you know, we've left the European Union. That debate is done and dusted. But there are ways in which we can start to rebuild some of those bridges. And uh, I, th I, think that at, I do think that at some point, the British people will say, OK, the debate about leaving the EU or not is done and dusted. But let's now be pragmatic. Let's be constructive. Um, and maybe some good old British pragmatism will be brought back to the foreground. Do you feel that Labour's getting its message across to the public? I, I think we, I think well, certainly over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, the message has been uh, getting across to people, if, you, if the opinion polls are, be, are to be believed. Uh, I, I think we need um, Keir's speech and uh, the pamphlet he, that he produced before conference uh, absolutely in the right place for us. Um, it is about rebuilding trust and reconnecting uh, after a really turbulent period in Labour's uh, history of the last five to six years. There are a lot of people out there who, who are just not really sure what the Labour Party stands for anymore, who we stand for. Uh, and we have been fighting amongst ourselves for five, to six, five or six years. I think that, that speech was a milestone in terms of saying we are now a party that is looking outwards. We are focusing on themes of community, and good work and equality and of a society that, where we care for each other. And that's where Keir is coming from. That's what, makes it, that's what gets him out of bed in the morning. I think what we need to do now, and that's very much what the Renaissance Project is about that we've, we've been working on, is about um, boiling that down into a small number of compelling stories about the future of the country. Good jobs you can raise a family on. Sensible management of the public finances. Uh, being really prudent with taxpayers' money, value for money is paramount. Um, and a Britain that can stand on its own two feet, rebuilding our manufacturing sector so that we can reduce our reliance uh, on very extended supply chains and actually begin to bring those good jobs and all of those skills and that research and development and the exciting opportunities for engaging with universities and innovation, and those small, uh, often family-run businesses that should be the backbone of our manufacturing sector. That, that's where we need to go with this now so that we've got those kind of three or four very clear messages. Uh, you can call it a pledge card if you like. Oh, God, I was going to ask you, what would you put on the pledge card? That was my next question. Uh, and, that, and that's where we need to go. And that, and that needs to happen with the greatest possible urgency because there could well be a general election in, well, a lot of people are talking about May 2023, but we need to be on an election footing right now. And, and that means we can't just sit back and wait for the Conservative Party to implode, which might happen, but that's never the, that never wins elections. That never gets you more than 35% of the vote. We've got to make it absolutely clear to the British people who we are, what we stand for. We are the party of work and good jobs, and uh, we're going to bring those good jobs back to your community. Uh, okay. And I think if we can do that over the next 18 months, then we will be uh, in with a very good chance of winning the next general election. Well, since you answered my last question, I'm going to put a personal one. I'm one of those people who lost faith of the Labour Party and left after 40 years, and I still haven't come back. Why should I rejoin the Labour Party? I think because you can see that we are now a credible party of government again, uh, that we will look after taxpayers' money, we will invest where investment is required, we are passionate about bringing those good jobs and opportunities back to the communities that, that need them. And, and, and we are, this isn't just about 
electoral calculus. This is actually about the moral duty and mission of the party. Because if we're not standing up for those people, then who are we? What do we even exist for? And I think we are genuinely, under Keir's leadership, we are coming back into that place. Uh, we've still got a long way to go. I mean, we've got to win 124 seats at the next general election in order to form a government without any other party. Um, we need you back, Fiona. We need people like you back. <laughs> Because there's if a, there's a small it. problem about my civil partner who's been expelled from Labour, so I'm not, I'm not coming back till they let him back in. So. Oh, right, OK, well, you, you, you can... I, I probably shouldn't comment for all sorts of reasons about, on, on Alistair's current status as a membership or not of the Labour Party, but he should be back as well, it's absolutely clear, and, and we hope that we can rebuild that trust and bring people like you back into the well, party. That, we need you. That would certainly be the big tent if we came back. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much, Stephen Kinnock. Thank you.